Chapter 11 of Mystery of the Ambush in India A Thief in the Night In their half-wrecked cage, Chandra and Kamuka realized all too thoroughly how the prospect of sure death had switched from them to Biff. After their experience, his frantic shout told them everything. It was pitch dark in back of the jeep's headlights. The marksmen in the trees couldn't even guess the tiger's location, let alone stop it with a chance shot. But it wasn't a chance shot that came. From one of the platforms, a sharp beam of light cut a thin path through the blackness, turning a brilliant spotlight on the open jaws and glittering eyes of the great beast that was already mashing the jeep's windshield with its mammoth paw. That sudden shaft of life was a bull's-eye in itself. Now, if a rifle muzzle could only score an identical hit. As that hope sprang to the boys who watched from the cage, it was answered in a realistic way. A rifle crackled. The tiger's big head jolted back and its snarl broke. Biff saw that happen as he looked up from behind the wheel. Now the tiny circle of light was focused just behind the tiger's ear. Again the rifle spoke. The tiger's whole body came forward, but not in a lunge. Instead, its quarter ton of dead weight landed across the jeep's hood, crushing it down upon the motor. Then the striped body rolled to the ground, where the sharp beam picked it out again, probing it from head to tail. No further shots were necessary. Biff came up shakily behind the wheel, found that the jeep would still run, and backed it so the headlight shone full on the tiger. The creature not only was motionless, its odd, distorted pose proved that life had left it. Barma Shah came down from his platform bringing the rifle with the thing that looked like a telescopic sight above the barrel. Only it wasn't a telescopic sight. It was a special flashlight powered by multiple batteries and focused down to almost a needle beam. I knew I might need this, declared Barma Shah, so I tested it last night at just the right range. The light is the rifle's sight. He lifted the gun, pointed it up into the trees, and picked out the top step leading to the platform that he had just left. Just spot your target, pull the trigger, and that's it. That was it, complimented Biff, but it took a good cool hands and steady nerves to do it. Barma Shah's ragged features spread into a broad smile. He suggested that instead of going back to the village, the boys accompany him to the hunting lodge at Kiwal, Biff accepted the invitation, but Chandra wanted to return to Supari to give the villagers a first-hand account of his harrowing experience in the cage. Naturally, he needed Kamuka to support his testimony, so Barma Shah agreed to pick them up at Supari in the morning. The Kiwal hunting lodge impressed Biff immensely, as it was equipped with all modern conveniences, including air conditioning. It also had a telephone, to which Barma Shah gestured as soon as he and Biff were alone. Then, with a broad, pleased smile, he declared, I talked with Calcutta by long distance this afternoon. You will be glad to know that Diwan Chand and his gatekeeper, Nathu, came out all right. Nobody was after them. Biff grinned, then became serious. I know that, he said, they were after me, and this. Biff brought out the watertight container. From it he took the chamois bag, then the jewel case, finally the huge glowing ruby. He handed the jewel to Barma Shah, who studied it as though he had seen it often. Then as the stone's glint suddenly became more vivid, Biff added, Diwan Chan said its sparkle showed that the charm was working well, but you had a lot to do with that tonight. Tonight, perhaps, yes, Barma Shah returned the gem to Biff and shook his head. But the other day, if I had known you would run into that trouble at Chan's, I would have gone there myself instead. But Mr. Chan said that you were marked. True, but so were you, as it turned out. Yes, agreed Biff, but Chandra helped me out fast enough. Our real trouble was with the thugs on the road. Thugs on the road? Tell me about that. Biff detailed the incidents of the train trip, the detour by the old abandoned temple and their final arrival at the Grand Trunk Road. As he concluded the account, Barma Shah shook his head again. And to think that I let you go through all that, he said, while I was waiting for you on the Grand Trunk Road. But how, queried Biff, did you know that we were coming that way? 
from your father explained barma shah he told me all about chandra the boy who worked for jinnah jad that is why i came here to kiwal so i would be near the village of supari where chandra's uncle lives naturally chandra would bring you there but how did we happen to come along just when you were here for a tiger hunt and the villagers were so terribly excited over it they are always tiger hunting here at kiwal replied barma shah with a smile and the people in Supari are easily excited. If Matapar cries tiger, tiger, he knows that Thakur will bring out the villagers as beaters by day and even as bait by night. I never thought of that. And I never realised that the thugs were so active again, commented Barma Shah. The way the Kali cult took over that old temple is surprising indeed. I shall notify the local authorities and have them investigate it. Perhaps it is more widespread than it appears. The next day, Barma Shah and Biff drove over to the village and picked up Chandra and Kamuka. They continued on their way, laughing over the fact that, of all the party, the one that had taken the worst beating from the tiger hunt was the jeep. However, the staunch vehicle was in good running order and the boys began to enjoy their tour with Barma Shah. A tour it actually became, for Barma Shah decided it should be that way. He even insisted that Chandra put on European clothes similar to what Biff and Kamuka were wearing. So they stopped at the first important town on the Grand Trunk Road and bought Chandra his new outfit. Chandra was amazed when he studied himself in a big mirror at the clothing store this is better than any jadu, decided Chandra. If Jinnah Jad should put me in the basket wearing my old clothes and bring me out in new like these, people would think I was a different boy. You'd have to make jadu yourself, returned Biff. It would take real magic for you to change clothes while you were curled around the inside of that basket. Chandra laughed at that and then the laugh was turned on Biff when Barma Shah picked out a woven straw hat with a rounded dome-shaped crown and broad, sharply downturned brim. He placed it on Biff's head saying, try this on for size. The hat was so big that it came clear down over Biff's eyes, the brim hiding his face almost to the jawline. Looks like Biff is trying the basket trick himself, observed Chandra merrily. Where did he go, Kamuka? I don't know, replied Kamuka. Last I saw, he was climbing into a basket that looked like a hat. Now he is vanished, complete. Biff ripped off the hat, somewhat red-faced and flustered, only to enjoy a laugh himself when he saw Chandra and Kamuka peering over counters and behind racks as though they were trying to find where he had gone. Then Barma Shah was handing Biff some smaller hats of the same style, and among them Biff discovered one that was just his size. Very good, approved Barma Shah. That brim still comes low enough to hide your hair rather well. And the sun visor helps too. The visor was of dark transparent plastic set in front of the hat brim, and it added somewhat to the depth of Biff's tan. It proved helpful, too, when Biff was driving the jeep, for Varma Shah decided to travel along secondary highways that lacked the shade provided by the Grand Trunk Road. Traffic, too, was less, but rough stretches of road slowed their trip. There were delays, too, at rivers where there were no bridges, only ferries that looked like tiny floats or rafts, the sort that might tip the jeep into the first current they encountered. But the rafts were well balanced, and the natives were skilful with their poles and oars. Each crossing was made without incident. Barma Shah had brought sleeping bags and bedding so they could stop at Dak bungalows or rest houses along the way. To all appearances, Barma Shah might have been a private tutor taking some privileged scholars on an educational tour of the Indian byroads. And in fact, the boys were learning a lot. Biff was especially impressed by the monkeys. He thought he had already seen a lot of them in India, but now they were boldly jumping over the jeep whenever it stopped and ready to snatch up whatever they saw and wanted. Chandra said there were a hundred million monkeys in India. Biff was ready to believe it when they stopped at a Dak bungalow near Agra and had to slam doors in the faces of the creatures to keep them from coming in the bedrooms. That afternoon they drove into Agra to see the famed Taj Mahal 
on the bank of the Jamuna River. One of the world's most beautiful buildings, it impressed Biff as a dream brought to reality in living marble. Later they went to a telegraph office where Biff sent a wire to his mother, which simply stated, All well, still on way, love to you and twins. Barma Shah decided that the telegram told enough, yet not too much. He smiled when Biff also showed him a postcard with a picture of the Taj Mahal, which had the printed statement, India's most priceless jewel for you to hold in memory. Under that, Biff had written, and I really am holding it, bag and all. Biff. He had addressed a card to Likake Mehanelli at Darjeeling. Send it, decided Barma Shah. Only your Hawaiian friend will know that you mean the ruby rather than the Taj Mahal. After dinner at a restaurant in Agra, they drove back to view the Taj by moonlight, when its graceful marble dome and slender minarets were softened into an incomparable silvery whiteness, a striking contrast to its splendour by day. They were still talking about the Taj when they arrived back at the rest house, where they reduced their tones to whispers rather than rouse the monkeys, which apparently had gone to sleep in the trees. But when Biff himself was dozing off, he heard occasional patter on the roof and scratchy sounds outside his window, indicating that some of the creatures were about. In his dreams, Biff could see monkeys swarming over everything, even the Taj Mahal, until, oddly, they seemed to be clambering over the cot itself. Still half asleep, yet aware of where he was, Biff could feel their breath on his face, their pesky hands clutching at the bag containing the ruby. Then Biff's eyes came open. He made a convulsive grab with both hands. In the filtering moonlight from the window, he saw a face that was human in size and form, yet leering like a monkey's. He caught hands that were human too, but long, thin-fingered, and as writhing in their touch as a snake's coils. Swiftly, expertly, those hands had grabbed the pouch that contained the great ruby and were twisting its chain around Biff's neck like a strangle cord. Chapter 12. A Double Surprise The struggle that followed was frantic but brief. It couldn't have lasted long, for Biff was unable to wrench the attacker's hands from the chain that they so cruelly twisted. It was already cutting off Biff's breath, and blood supply, so that his eyes were seeing black spots in the moonlight. Biff shifted his grip to his attacker's throat, but it didn't help. If anything, it made him twist the chain harder. Biff couldn't call for help, though the walls of the bungalow were thin enough for even a gargly cry to be heard. But there was a way to make people hear. As he lashed about, Biff managed to shove the cot away from the wall. Then, wrenching himself to a new position, he began kicking the wall with his feet, pounding a terrific drumbeat. There was a muffled, excited cry from the next room, then answering shouts above the din that Biff was raising. The whole Dak bungalow was aroused. Right then, Biff was hoping to jab his attacker's neck nerves, judo style, which would have turned the tables completely. But his squirmy foe didn't wait. He managed to yank the ruby bag clear from its chain. Griffing his prize, he twisted away, turned and bounded for the window. Biff beat him there by rolling over on his hands and knees, then blocking the fugitive with a headlong dive. The squirmy man turned and darted towards the door, just as it burst open and Barma Shah came driving in. He met the attacker and snatched for the bag which came open, spilling out the ruby. By then, Biff was piling into the fray. He and Barma Shah both grabbed for the gleaming gem, while the squirmy man took off empty-handed. It was Barma Shah who saved the ruby with one hand, while he held Biff back with the other. Chandra and Kamuka were already taking up the chase from their rooms, as were other guests. Coolly, Barma Shah told Biff, Leave it to them. We don't want people to know what the fellow was after. Here is the ruby, so put it away again. The advice was good, so Biff accepted it. For the moment, he wondered if they'd really regained the ruby, for it looked as dull as a lump of coal there in Barma Shah's hand. But as Biff took it, all the gem's lustre returned, and it scintillated in the moonlight with a vivid fire that seemed to throw off living sparks. Satisfied, Biff put the ruby back in its bag. The excitement roused hundreds of monkeys from their tree trunks, and with all their jumping and chatter, no one was able to catch up with Biff's attacker. 
The Kansama who kept the Dak bungalow was all apologies when an examination showed that this window screen had been loosened, by whom no one knew. Barma Shah, a spokesman for the boys, dismissed it as a trifling matter. But in the morning, Barma Shah went into Agra to talk to the police. He returned in time for an early lunch, which the Kansama, who was cook as well as innkeeper, had specially prepared. It consisted of dalmoth, or fried lentils, with thin shavings of lentil paste, and it was followed by a dish of petha, a crystallized melon served in slices. When Barma Shah and the boys pulled away in the jeep, he had made no further mention of the near robbery of the night before. But as they rode along the highway towards Delhi, Barma Shah discussed the matter with the boys. The police weren't impressed, Barma Shah declared. They say there is nothing to this talk of thuggy coming back in the form of a Kala cult. People are simply confusing them with roving bands of thieves, like the old Pindaris. Other countries have gangsters, why not India? But we saw the Kali statue, Biff began. I know. Well, declared Barma Shah, whether that man last night was a petty thief or a thug playing a lone hand to deceive us, we won't take more chances. Barma Shah's method was simple. They drove on to Delhi and pulled into the old city after dark. There, Barma Shah let the boys off on a quiet street and continued on alone in the jeep towards Simla. He had given them an address where they could find him. Only a block from where they were dropped off, the boys came to a rooming house that Barma Shah had mentioned. They stayed there overnight and began planning their next step which was to reach the American embassy without attracting special notice. See what you can find out, Chandra, suggested Biff. Say that you're a student who would like to know about the United States. Remember, there are a lot of American nations, so be sure to specify the United States. Maybe we can slide you in there to pave the way for me. All this was in keeping with advice from Diwan Chand in Calcutta, which Barma Shah in his turn had stressed even more, namely that spies might be watching every move that Biff made. Events along the line had definitely underlined the need for caution. So Chandra, still wearing his European clothes, set out on a hired bicycle, the most popular type of transportation in India's capital city of New Delhi, which adjoined the old Mughal capital of Delhi. A few hours later, Chandra rejoined the other boys in a colourful bazaar where he had left them. I have good news, he exclaimed. Every week students go by special bus to meet and talk with ambassadors from other countries. That sounds like a United Nations proposition, commented Biff. No, no, returned Chandra. I checked that. They go to a different country's embassy every week. So I look at the list and what do you think is next? United States, tomorrow. Nice work, approved Biff. That sounds like our ticket, all right. It is our ticket, all right, Chandra grinned. Three tickets for bus tomorrow. I ask and I get them. So we go along with big crowd and nobody will guess who we are. Since the students were all from Indian schools located in New Delhi and elsewhere, Chandra and Kamuka decided to stay in their European clothes but Biff, somewhat to his annoyance, had to switch back to his seat costume. Otherwise he would be spotted for an American and perhaps for himself. Biff Brewster, if some keen observer happened to be looking for him. I suppose any Sikh students will be wearing their native garb too, commented Biff, like the railroad guards on the train. So don't let them spot me for a phony the way that man with the fake beard did on the Howrah bus. Funny thing, said Chandra, I keep thinking about him every now and then. I don't know just why, but don't worry, Kamuka and I will talk to people so they won't bother you. The bus tickets were simply cards that said student in English and its equivalent in Hindi characters. They were accepted without question and the boys took seats well back in the bus, which was nearly full when it started. All was fine until they stopped at a building where Biff looked up and saw a flag with three vertical stripes, red, white and green. You've made a mistake, Chandra, Biff groaned. This can't be the American embassy. That's not the United States flag. 
It must be, argued Chandra. Lots of countries change their flags. Maybe your country changes its flags too. No, we don't change the United States flag. From the bus window, Biff saw the flag flutter slightly, and now he noticed the emblem of an eagle on the white stripe. That's the Mexican flag, exclaimed Biff. As a sudden thought struck him, he asked, Just what did that list say, Chandra? It said students would pay visit to the embassy of the United States of... of... the United States of Mexico. Yes, that was it. It's my fault, Chandra, conceded Biff. I forgot that Mexico is officially known as the United States of Mexico. I should have told you the United States of America. Then you'd have checked on the American embassy. He turned to Kamuka. Dumb of me, wasn't it? Maybe I was dumb too, returned Kamuka. If I had told Chandra to look for the United States of Brazil, he would have brought us to the Brazilian embassy. I could tell our story there. You're right, Kamuka, acknowledged Biff. We had two chances out of three and we missed. Well, we can't sit here. We will have to follow the crowd. Follow the crowd they did. As the last three off the bus, Biff and his companions tagged on into the Mexican embassy and slid into a rear corner of the reception room where the students were seated. Members of the Mexican diplomatic corps proceeded to hold open forum with the students of New India, exchanging views on their respective countries. After an hour's session was completed, the students started out, shaking hands with the embassy staff as they went. Again, Biff and his companions held back. They were able to ease along behind the students, who were so interested in exchanging their own views that they did not notice the dragging trio. Biff, particularly, was glad to avoid the handshakes. The diplomat showed interest in a few genuine Sikh students, and Biff was afraid he would be asked embarrassing questions. There was just one greeter they could not avoid. Outside the reception room, a Mexican youth of about Biff's age had come up to shake hands with the students and was chatting briefly with them. Fortunately, his back was partly turned, so Biff saw a way to avoid him. You shake hands with him first, Kamuka, Biff whispered, but keep moving or he may guess that you are a Brazilian. You crowd in fast, Chandra, and keep him talking while I slide by. They had reached the youth by then, and Kamuka's handshake was over too quickly. Chandra, caught off stride, could not think what to say, so the young Mexican politely bowed him on with a brief shake, then turned with perfect poise to meet the last departing visitor, Biff. The Mexican's expression was momentarily quizzical as he studied the face beneath the Sikh turban. Chandra and Kamuka, glancing back, were sure Biff was getting by with his disguise when, to their horror, Biff himself gave the game away. As though suddenly gone crazy, Biff flung away his turban, sprang forward, grabbed the Mexican boy's shoulders, and began shaking the poise right out of him. The surprised youth gasped and grabbed at Biff as if in self-defense. Chandra and Kamuka turned to ward off any students who might come back to mix in the fray, only to see that they were all alone. That was when they heard Biff's shout, Mike Arista! Then Chandra and Kamuka realised it wasn't a fight at all, but just a genuine, heartfelt form of mutual recognition, as the Mexican boy exclaimed, Biff Brewster! Chapter 13. Biff's Mission the excitement of the meeting over, Biff realised that introductions were in order. He turned to Chandra and Kamuka. This is Miguel Arista, Mike to us, Biff said. He and I met in Mexico, where we went hunting for a lost Aztec treasure. We had some tough adventures together. Biff turned to Mike. This is Kamuka, Biff continued. I told you once about the trip that I took up the Amazon with him. And this is Chandra, the newest member of the team. He steered us through a lot of trouble from Calcutta to New Delhi. And I'm glad he did, return Mike. We've been watching for you everywhere. That is, for you and Kamuka, Biff. We hadn't heard about Chandra. We alerted the American and Brazilian embassies in case you turned up there. 
So, of all things, you walked into the Mexican embassy, the last place we expected to see you. How did that happen? That, replied Biff with a smile, was Chandra's idea. It looks like I picked the right United States, put in Chandra. He turned to Biff and Kamuka. You had chance number one and two. That gave me chance number three. I hit it right. You sure did, Biff agreed. He turned to Mike. But how do you come to be in India? How do you know about all this? You remember my uncle, the judge in Mexico City? Of course. I came here with him on a visit, and we happened to meet your father. My uncle can tell you about it better than I can. Mike paused a moment, then asked, Do you have the ruby? For answer, Biff looked around and saw that he and his friends were alone. Then he brought out the priceless packet, opened it, and displayed the light of the llama. It took Mike's breath away. Never before, perhaps, had the rare gem flashed more vividly, more dramatically, than at that moment. That was all Mike needed to see. Put it away, he said. We'll go over to my uncle's hotel and talk to him. Mike arranged for a cab and they went to the hotel. There they met Judge Felix Arista, a quiet man with a white beard and flowing hair that gave him a very austere expression. But the kindly welcome that he gave to Biff put Chandra and Kamuka completely at their ease. Then Judge Arista went further. He spoke to Kamuka in Portuguese, then to Chandra in Hindi, so fluently that both boys were quite overwhelmed. Judge Arista also assured Biff that all was well with his father, the last they had heard from him. Next, Judge Arista introduced a middle-aged man of military bearing named Colonel Gorak, who evidently held some key position with the government of India. Both were keenly interested in the ruby when Biff produced it. Then Judge Arista turned to the boys and said, Tell us all that has happened. Though Biff was eager to hear more about his father, he realised that Judge Arista was following proper procedure, learning the facts so that he and Colonel Gorak could weigh them. Biff related the events from the time the Northern Star had docked in Calcutta. Judge Arista encouraged Kamuka and Chandra to add their impressions. Chandra especially came in for questioning regarding Jinnah Jad, Diwan Chand and Barma Shah. All three boys had much to say about Barma Shah and their adventures with him, including how he had saved Biff's life during the tiger hunt and had later responded to Biff's call when a thug had tried to steal the ruby at the Dak bungalow. Judge Arista finally turned to Colonel Gorak and said, I am sure that we can trust these other boys as well as Biff, so I think they should all hear what you have to tell him about Senor Brewster. Colonel Gorak bowed acknowledgement, then spoke to Biff in an even methodical tone. Your father came here to India to open some old gold mines, related Colonel Gorak. We were hopeful that investors would supply money to work them. Among these mines were some that once belonged to the Raja of Bildapur, a small domain that was absorbed by a larger princely state, though the Raja's family still owned the mines until the Indian government finally acquired them. When miners went down into the old shafts, they met with inexplicable accidents. They claimed that the mines were haunted by ghosts and demons, but we blamed it on outside factions. However, Mr. Brewster found there was some basis for the superstition, as it was part of a legend dating back 500 years. As Colonel Gorak paused, Kamuka exclaimed despite himself, Five hundred years? That is a long, long time. Not in India, put in Chandra promptly. Here it is very short. Quite true, agreed Colonel Gorak seriously. Five hundred years ago, the ruling Raja of Bildapur received a magnificent ruby from the Grand Lama of Chonsi, a lost city near the border of India and Tibet, the saying was, while the light of the Lama shines, so will the star of the Raja. And that proved true, for the mines showed steady profits and were finally sold at a good price. Part of those profits were invested in gems which the Raja's family promised to give to the Chonsi Lama in return for the luck the ruby had brought them. 
That was to be done if ever the Raja's descendants disposed of their holding, which they finally did. But Mr. Brewster learned that the gems had been hidden by loyal servants of the Raja's family because outsiders were seeking them. As Colonel Gorak paused, Biff asked, By outsiders, do you mean the Kali cult, sir? For one, yes. For another, there is an international spy ring run by an adventurer named Bella Kron. We know little about him except that he will sell out to the highest bidder. Fortunately, Mr. Brewster located the gems and brought them here to New Delhi. And as I was here, added Judge Alistair, he came to see me first. I realized that this was an international matter, so I pressed it through the proper channels, and Colonel Gorak was assigned to the case. He has done admirably with it. Colonel Gorak shook his head to that. The real credit goes to Mr. Brewster, he insisted. His story was fantastic, but he had the gems to prove it and Judge Arista to vouch for him. So we had him go to Ladakh in eastern Kashmir, where he contacted secret messengers from the Grand Lama. They took him to Chonsi, where he delivered the jewels with the compliments of our government. There was just one problem. The light of the Lama was not among the gems. With that, Colonel Gorak gestured to the huge ruby that was glowing in the sunlight, as though its ruddy fire held all the secrets of the past centuries. Never had its sparkle been more vivid. No one could wonder why this was the most prized gem of all. We should have thought of that beforehand, declared Judge Elista, but we had not then seen the light of the Lama. He studied the gem again, then turned to Colonel Gorak, I can understand why the Chauncey Lama wants it, he said. Colonel Gorak nodded. So can I, he agreed. Then the Lama is keeping my father in Chauncey, asked Biff anxiously, until he gets the ruby, like a ransom. Not exactly, replied Colonel Gorak. Your father is still in Chauncey, yes. Because they won't let him go? No, no. It was Judge Arista who replied to Biff's anxious question. I am sure that he could leave at any time, but his mission would not have been completed. He wants to deliver the ruby too, explained Colonel Gorak, and he was sure that Barma Shah would be able to locate it because they had been working on it together, your father and Barma Shah. That calmed Biff immediately. His mind flashed back to the tiger hunt when Barma Shah had delivered that perfect shot while the shikaris were wondering what to do. Then he thought of the Dak bungalow and the way Barma Shah had rescued him there. Chandra must have realised what was in Biff's mind. It is all right, Biff, Chandra said encouragingly. Your father and Barma Shah, they are a team. Biff brightened as he turned to Judge Alistair. You mean that I am to go with Barma Shah, the boy asked, that he will be there too when we deliver the ruby? Exactly that, acknowledged Judge Arista. We are counting on both of you. Your father said that he had arranged for you to receive the ruby and that Barma Shah would do the rest. I have arranged for our trip to Chauncey, added Colonel Gorak. We can notify Barma Shah to meet us in Srinagar, the capital of Kashmir. From there, we will fly to Leh, the capital of Ladakh, where our equipment has been ordered and is waiting for us. Two thoughts swam through Biff's mind. In flying anywhere, he would like to be in a plane piloted by his uncle, Charles Keane, who, to Biff's thinking, was the greatest pilot ever. Next to his father, Uncle Charlie was the man he would most like to see right now. The other thought was, what was happening in Darjeeling? He felt concerned about his mother and the twins, and he was worried about Lee, who by now probably was worried about him. Su Tio Carlos, said Judge Arista, as though he had read Biff's mind. Your Uncle Charles. We reached him in Burma and asked him to fly from there to Darjeeling, so he would be ready to take off for Leh to join your party there. He is in Darjeeling now. With that, Judge Arista picked up the telephone and handed it to Biff, adding with a kindly smile, we have put in a long-distance call to your family in Darjeeling. You can talk to them right now. Chapter 14 The Valley of Doom 
Biff was right about Li being worried. From the time he had arrived in Darjeeling, after a ride in from the airport at Bagdogra, Li's worries had begun and stayed with him. He was wondering constantly how much he could tell the Brewsters if they asked him point-blank about Biff. Biff's mother, Martha Brewster, had met Likake Mayanelli in Hawaii at the time Biff and Lee had gone on their thrilling sea hunt together. The Brewster twins, 11-year-old Ted and Monica, had met Lee too, and they were bubbling with delight at seeing him again. Of course, they wanted to see their big brother too, so they peppered Lee with so many rapid-fire questions about Biff that Lee hadn't time to answer any of them, which turned out for the best. In a slightly reproving tone, Mrs. Brewster had suggested that the twins give their guest a chance to speak for himself. Thanks to that breather, as Biff would have termed it, Lee was able to state simply that Biff and Kamuka had gone directly to New Delhi in response to a message from Mr. Brewster. We heard from New Delhi too, Mrs. Brewster said. Mr. Brewster's company wired that he would be delayed and that Biff was being notified what to do. I'll bet Dad has taken Biff to see some super special gold mines, exclaimed Ted. I wish he'd asked me along. That must be it, added Monica, because Kamuka has been studying mining in Brazil. I'd like to have gone too. It's nice to hear you two agree on something, was Mrs. Brewster's smiling comment. But please notice that Likaki isn't sulking because he wasn't taken on the trip. That's the way a real grown-up would act. Lee didn't mention that Biff had also received a wire from the Ajax Mining Company. He merely said that he was sure they would hear from Biff as soon as he reached New Delhi. As the days passed, the twins had a wonderful time with Lee. Among other things, they went on a picnic to Tiger Hill, where they viewed Mount Everest, the world's highest peak, which towered more than 29,000 feet. To Lee, it was no more impressive than the 28,000-foot summit of Kanchenjunga, which could be seen from Darjeeling. But he reserved opinion on that and almost everything else, rather than start the twins speculating on what their brother Biff might think about it. The next step then would be, why hadn't they heard from Biff? A question Lee couldn't answer. Lee was relieved when Biff's wire came from Agra because he honestly didn't know why Biff had stopped there. But Lee knew nothing yet of the postcard which was still on its way when Mrs. Brewster's brother, Charles Keane, flew in from Burma and stated that he had been summoned to Darjeeling by an official call from New Delhi. With Charles Keane in the twin-engine Cessna was a burly, red-haired mechanic known as Muscles, who hailed from the state of Kentucky and was proud of it. The plane also brought a Burmese boy named Chuba, who had guided Biff across the border into China to rescue Biff's uncle when he had been a prisoner there. Biff had detailed those adventures to Lee, who already regarded Chuba as an old friend. So after a brief but hearty get-acquainted session, Lee decided to confide in Chuba. They had taken a stroll to look at the Kanchenjunga, which Lee stated was the third highest mountain in the world, when Chuba asked what two were bigger, Lee told him, Everest and K2, known as Mount Godwin, Austin, which was far north in Kashmir. Chuba shrugged at that. To me, Minya Konka looks bigger, he asserted. That's the mountain Biff and I saw in China. Perhaps that is because we got a look at it from lower down. Kamuka would say that about the Andes, laughed Lee. To him... They would look bigger. Seriously, he added, that was while you were hunting for Viss, Uncle Charlie? Chuba nodded. We may have to start a search for Viss' father, continued Lee. Biff only heard from him indirectly. Noting Chuba's keen interest, Lee told him all that had happened in Calcutta. He also mentioned his worry about whether or not he should inform Viss' family as to those facts or wait until he received direct word from Biff. Chuba promptly solved that problem. You have trouble, Chava told Lee, and Sahib Keen is trouble shooter. If you don't hear from Biff by tomorrow, I'll talk to Sahib Keen. Then he will talk to you. They didn't have to talk with Charles Keen the next day, for they talked to Biff himself instead. 
That was when the long-distance call came from Judge Arista in New Delhi. Biff talked to his mother first, explaining the situation briefly. Then Judge Arista came on the wire, assuring Mrs. Brewster that all was probably well with her husband. At the same time, Judge Arista stated that the trip to Chauncey was not only urgent but dangerous. Colonel Gorak confirmed that when he spoke both to Biff's mother and his uncle Charlie. But all agreed that the mission was imperative, and since it was necessary for Biff to accompany the party, the other boys should have their choice in the matter too. Their choice was unanimous. They all said they would go. Lee and Chava talked to Biff and told him that. Then Biff introduced Kamuka and Chandra to Chava, and finally he had Mike Arista on the line, having him meet both Lee and Chava. It was Uncle Charlie who ended that round robin. Let me get my instructions, he insisted, taking the telephone from the boys at his end, before the Indian government has to dig another gold mine to pay for this long-distance call. Uncle Charlie not only took instructions, he was filled in on all the details of the Rajah's Ruby, otherwise known as the Light of the Lama, as well as Biff's adventures since leaving Calcutta. Uncle Charlie went into all that for the benefit of the breathless listeners, who included his nephew Ted and his niece Monica. Then, we're taking off today, Charles Keane stated, by way of Kathmandu, the capital of Nepal. Then a big hop over to Leh. If bad weather delays us, we can meet the party somewhere between Leh and the Tibetan border. They've given me a list of locations where they will stop. So let's get ready to go. That was meant for Lee and Chava, but Ted and Monica thought that they were included, for they jumped up and were rushing off the pack when their Uncle Charlie called them back. No small fry, he said. You're staying here. Oh, no, the twins wailed in one voice. We both voted to go. That vote was for teenagers only, returned Uncle Charlie. Somebody has to stay here and look after your mother. Besides, the Cessna only carries five passengers, and we have four already. Lee, Chava, Muscles, and myself. But if we're small fry, argued Monica, the two of us would only count as one. Or maybe you don't want girls along, interrupted Ted. So in that case, you can take just me. Monica turned on Ted at that and was pounding him to show how tough her fist could really be when Uncle Charlie moved in and separated them as he said, Break it up. Muscles is so big he counts for two, so that makes five passengers already. Sorry, no more room. When they reached the airfield, Muscles had the plane all ready for the flight. The massive mechanic was standing guard and glaring suspiciously at any workers who came near the plane. That is Muscles' way, Charles Keane said approvingly, with an international spy ring haunting an old gold mine and thugs trying to steal a ruby as a gift for the goddess Kali. Almost anything could happen to any of us anywhere. Then, with Charles Keane at the controls, the plane was climbing from the runway in the direction of the snow-capped Himalayas, where dozens of magnificent peaks seemed to grow into sight, to match huge Kanchenjunga and even more distant Everest. The higher the plane rose, the more mountains loomed above it. Avoiding those vast peaks, Charles Keane worked the plane above valleys and passes that formed openings in the massive barrier. The ranges rode skyward like great steps until the plane reached the fertile Kathmandu Valley near the centre of Nepal, a great green oasis in a vast desert of rocky crags and the perpetual snow of the surrounding Himalayas. Kathmandu was a colourful city of temples, Padogas and palaces that rose from among lesser buildings and great open squares. The altitude was a little more than 4,000 feet, and Charles Keane made a landing at the airfield to check on weather reports, while Muscles gave the plane another going over. From there, the plane took off westward, passing south of the great twin peaks of Annapurna and Dalagiri, gigantic sentinels 20 miles apart with Deep Valley tapering down to a river gorge between their five-mile summits. 
It's too soon to head north, decided Charles Keene, even though that gap does look inviting. It would take us into Tibet and we might have problems picking a course over into Kashmir. We'll do better this way. This way took them out of Nepal and soon they were flying over India again. There, Biff's uncle finally swung to the north and again the Himalayas loomed ahead. Then they were knifing through fleecy clouds at 250 miles an hour straight towards the disputed Tibetan border. This course will bring us into Leh, Charles Keane declared, as the clouds began to thicken, but we'd better get more altitude. A gigantic mass of solid snowy white rose through a rift in the clouds. As the plane skimmed over it, they all drew a relieved breath. We nearly scraped frosting off cake, Chuba said. Charles Keane smiled, but a bit grimly, as he studied his chart again. Then, if that was Nanda Devi, he declared, we are away off course. He turned to Muscles. Is the altimeter right? he asked. It was when I checked it last. Then we aren't climbing as we should. The plane droned on, in and out of cloud banks, above valleys filled with mist. Fortunately, no more mountains rose in their path, but clouds were thickening up ahead and the plane was not responding properly. We're almost over the northern range, Uncle Charlie said but tackling those cloud banks would be risky and turning back would be worse. We'll do better making a forced landing in one of those forgotten valleys. Providing the visibility is good enough at landing level, put in Muscles, we may encounter ground fog. That's the chance we take, Uncle Charlie conceded, but I don't think it has settled deeply yet. Coolly, Charles Keane zoomed over two low-lying mountain ranges, then banked his plane towards a wide space where a trace of green showed deep beneath the gathering mist. The white blanket thickened as he approached it, and the plane, as he descended, was swallowed completely in those swirling folds. The roar of the motor was muffled. Then it, too, faded entirely. Silence reigned again above the mist-filled valleys of the Himalayas, the strange, mysterious stillness that the mightiest of mountains had known since the dawn of time. Chapter 15. The Caravan Halts So this is Strinagar. Biff Brewster spoke from the bow of a narrow, rakish craft known as a Shikara. As two turbaned oarsmen propelled us along the river Jhelum through the heart of Kashmir's capital city. Between Biff and the stern, where both paddlers were seated was a large canopy mounted on ornamental poles. Reclining beneath it were Chandra, Kamuka and Mike Arista. The front of the canopy bore the boat's name, Happy Days, for these gondolas of the Himalayan Venice were particularly popular with American visitors. As they swept along beneath the ancient wooden bridges that spanned the Jhelum, the boys waved to passengers in passing shikaras with signs bearing such varied titles as Hot Dog, The Big Mo, and Chattanooga Choo Choo. Picturesque buildings flanked both sides of the waterway, and beneath their balconies were native craft called Dungas, on which whole families lived. Far more pretentious were the lavish houseboats occupied by Europeans and Americans. These were more in evidence after the Shikara brought them to the Dal Gate, the outlet for Dal Lake. From there they followed more canals to the lake itself, where they wove among actual floating gardens to the five-mile stretch of open water beyond. Sunset was tinging Dal Lake with a deep crimson that purpled the blue lake and its surrounding foliage against the magnificent backdrop of the snow-clad Himalayas. Fine sunset, Kamuka appraised it, much better than on the Hooli. And all we need, commented Biff, studying the mirrored sunset in the placid water, is for a boar to come roaring down the lake. This water buggy would really wind up in a happy days. Even that imaginary menace was ended when they reached their destination, a houseboat named Pride of the Deodars. This was a stout ship in its own right, measuring 120 feet from stem to stern, as Biff put it, with a width or beam of 16 feet. 
Before taking off from New Delhi, Colonel Gorak had engaged the pride of the Deodars for their overnight stay in Srinagar and had come directly here while the boys were taking their river trip. Smilingly, the colonel showed them through an actual floating mansion, for the pride, as the boys promptly called it, had a huge living room and a sizable dining room, each with a fireplace, plus three bedrooms with private baths. A native chef served a tasty dinner from the ample kitchen. After the meal, the boys went to the living room. They were seated in front of the fireplace when a light glimmered cautiously from the water close by, and they heard a shikara scrape alongside the pride. Barma Shah, stated Colonel Gorak. I contacted him at the address in Simla. Gorak turned to Biff. I had never met him, so you can introduce us. When Barma Shah entered, he was wearing his beret and tinted glasses, as excellent a disguise as ever, for when he removed them, his complexion changed in colour and his face seemed to broaden, probably because of his widespread ears. His high forehead and short clipped hair were deceptive too, for the beret had hidden them well. Colonel Gorak nodded his approval. I can understand why you have managed to stay under cover, Gorak declared. I have dozens of reports from men who have contacted you at one time or another. The colonel gestured to an attaché case on the table, but not one could give me more than a vague description of you. Unfortunately, most of those who knew me best are gone, returned Barma Shah in a regretful tone. They were marked for death, as I have been. I know that, nodded Colonel Gorak. All of you were in constant danger from all sides when you tried to quell those riots between rival factions, especially in Calcutta. The danger still is great, declared Barma Shah, and that is why I show myself so seldom. During the past year or more, only two men really met me face to face, so far as learning my identity. One was Diwan Chand, and the other Thomas Brewster. Recently, of course, he gestured towards Biff and his companions, I told these boys who I was, because once I was clear of Calcutta, I felt the need for secrecy was gone. So now, Barma Shah finished with a bow, we meet at last, Colonel Gorak. And the meeting is a timely one, returned Gorak, because you are the man who can help us most. The colonel spread out a large map of Kashmir on the table, ran his finger from Srinagar eastward to Leh, the principal city of Ladakh. Then he inched it, zigzag fashion, towards the boundary between India and Tibet, which was marked with a dotted line, indicating its uncertainty. Charles Keane will meet you in Leh, explained Colonel Gorak or at one of your latest stopping points. When you reach the vicinity of Chauncey, wherever it may be, you will be contacted and guided to that lost city. Farmer Shah looked up, slightly puzzled. You aren't coming with us, Colonel Gorak? he asked. No, this is not a military mission, nor even an official expedition. Mr. Brewster went there on his own, and personally promised to deliver the Raja's ruby to the Chauncey Lama, once the gem was found. Since the descendants of the Raja were supposed to deliver it to the successor of the Lama, tradition demands that Mr. Brewster's promise be fulfilled by his son. Again, in keeping with tradition, the boy should be accompanied by someone close of kin, so we have chosen his uncle Charles for that purpose. And since you, Barma Shah, played the vital part in recovering the lost ruby, you are entitled to go along as its temporary guardian. As Colonel Gorak finished, Barma Shah smiled. You should have picked Diwan Chand for my job, he said, but as for going along, I don't think Diwan Chand would have, so I guess I'll have to do. You will do very well. Any more questions? Just one, Colonel. What about the Chauncey Lama? Have you any reports on him? Nearly twenty years ago, stated Colonel Gorak, the Chauncey Lama visited Leh and received a tremendous ovation. He was then a man in his early thirties and impressed all who met him with his great vigour and his keen mind. In the years since, the Chauncey Lama has preserved the balance of the border. He has refused to listen to the demands of dictators who have tried to curb his power. 
They are unable to oust him because they cannot find him. And all the while his influence has increased, Barma Shah inquired. Yes, today the Chauncey Lama is regarded as one of the wisest men in the East and, without a doubt, the most mysterious. No one has seen him since that time in Leh, but he has been heard from often, and his well-weighed decisions have increased his fame. Now in his early fifties he is probably at the peak of his career, that is, if Lamas have careers. When one dies, his spirit is supposed to be reincarnated in an infant born at that same time, who then continues on as a living Buddha. Biff and the other boys wanted to hear more on that intriguing subject, but Barma Shah asked, Will anyone block us between Leh and Chauncey? One man will if he can, returned Gorak grimly. That is Bella Kron, who heads the international spy ring. Have you ever run across him here in India? No, but I would like to, Barma Shah gritted his teeth and clenched his fists. I would repay him in kind for the way he tortured some of my friends. I know, Colonel Gorak tapped the attaché case significantly. The reports are all in here, but would you recognize Bellacron if you saw him? No, because I could not possibly have met him. Brewster may have, around those mines in Vildapur, but Bellacron would have been very wary any time he came to Calcutta. That ended the conference for the evening. Tingling with excitement, the boys found it difficult to go to sleep, even in the luxurious houseboat. When they finally did drop off, the night seemed very short indeed, for Colonel Gorak woke them early for their morning flight to Leh. The 500-mile trip was interesting, for below the boys saw samples of the rugged terrain that they would have to cover later on. The nearest thing to a road was a crude trail that led through mountain passes 12,000 feet in altitude, where the plain flew low between the Hemming Himalaya ranges. There were occasional squatty villages and Buddhist monasteries perched high upon the mountainsides. These gave an idea of what Chauncey would be like if they ever found the place. The immediate objective was lay, and it proved interesting when they landed there, Though a town of only a few thousand inhabitants, its bazaars showed a mingling of many races, including tribes, in outlandish costumes, for this was the trade centre where goods came in from Tibet by caravan. Biff and his companions found the equipment ready and the arrangements all made for their trek to the border, but Charles Keene and his Cessna had not yet arrived. For two full days they waited with the strain continually increasing, the only news was a roundabout report from Kathmandu stating that the Cessna had put down there and then resumed its flight on the very day that Biff and his companions had flown from New Delhi up to Srinagar. On the third day, Colonel Gorak, who had come along this far, decided that the caravan must start. Barma Shah agreed. There is still a chance that your uncle's plane made a safe landing, Gorak told Biff, but by now he will suppose that you have left Leh, so there is no need of staying here. In fact, it would be a mistake, declared Barma Shah, for your uncle has our schedule and may be expecting us at one of the stopping posts. We are already a day late, but the first two stages are short, so we can make them in a single day. Paced by plodding, heavily laden yaks, they made the required distance by nightfall. Their course was towards the glistening mountains to the south. But the whiteness that worried Biff was not the snow upon the Himalayan summits. The thick clouds surrounding the lower levels were the menace. They filled the passes and the valleys beyond, the only places where the plane could have made a landing. By morning the clouds were heavier still and Barma Shah was anxious to make an early start because of the threatening snow. Biff pleaded with him to wait, so they did for another hour, studying the increasing snow clouds. It's no use, Barma Shah decided finally. We can hardly see the slopes now. Anyone coming through those passes would have to turn back. Biff nodded hopelessly, but as he took one last look through a pair of field glasses, he was sure he detected motion in the distant haze. Then, against the snowy background, he saw three figures. One paused as they struggled forward and waved his arms in a characteristic gesture. Excitedly, Biff exclaimed, Uncle Charlie! 
End of chapter 15. Recording by Peter Tomlinson.